Well, thank you very much for your welcome. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, it's a beautiful auditorium. I hope you really enjoy it. Um, as has been said, I've been pastor at Ashgrove, one of three, um, and I'm also the director of Ashgrove Community Care, which is a local counselling centre. We had the vision for this centre about 11 years ago, and we've now been operational for eight years. Three counsellors, all Christians, active in their home churches, not all Baptist, and our reception is manned by a group of volunteers. We have a range of fees, but it's very affordable compared to other community agencies. But besides counselling and pastoral and professional supervision, we offer CareForce programs regularly, and like you, we also do Alpha programs. So we're currently doing Alpha Parenting. You know, the first session of our CareForce programs always focus on healing. And it's premised on the idea that we get wounded in life without even trying. But we need to be intentional if we want to heal and grow. And right back at the beginning when we started these courses and people came to the first session, some of them would be quite taken back and they would say to me, there's nothing wrong with me. But you know, I rarely hear that today because most attendees are willing to own that they're broken. And it's such a positive change in churches because there is a connection between emotional health and our spiritual maturity. You know, sometimes on our healing journey, we need someone to walk with us, to hear our story, to understand the pain we feel, to give us a fresh perspective on our struggle. And that's where counseling is of great value. And of course, as counsellors and as clients, we rely on the Holy Spirit in this process. I have left some brochures outside if you're interested. If you want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine too. You know, to heal and grow, we need God's help. We need to persevere in the midst of our hardships and to rise above our natural human reactions and allow God to do his transforming work. And as I say that, I want to lead into our reading this morning, which is from Romans 8, 28 to 39. And because it's very familiar, I hope you will excuse me for using the J.B. Phillips version. Let's read it. Moreover, we know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. Now, the NIV says all things work together for good, and that doesn't mean that we'll always see a good outcome from everything we experience. You see, we often see our relationship through an individualistic lens. Well, that was less so for Paul. He saw it as part of a much bigger picture. We go on from there. God, in his foreknowledge, chose them to bear the family likeness of his son, that he might be the eldest of a family of many brothers. He chose them long ago. When the time came, he called them, he made them righteous in his sight, and then lifted them to the splendor of life as his own sons. In face of all this, what is there left to say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He that did not hesitate to spare his own son but gave him up for us all. Can we not trust such a God to give us, with him, everything else that we need? But just a reminder, God is not a genie or a Santa Claus who fulfills all our wishes just to make us happy. And just as God defines good in verse 28, so he defines need in this verse. Who would dare to accuse us whom God has chosen? The judge himself has declared us free from sin. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, 
pain or persecution? Can lack of clothes and food, danger to life and limb, the threat of force of arms? Indeed, some of us know the truth of the ancient text, and he's referring to Psalm 44. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through him who has proved his love for us. I have become absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, neither messenger of heaven nor monarch of earth, neither what happened today or what may happen tomorrow, neither a power from on high nor a power from below, nor anything else in God's whole world has any power to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. An amazing passage, isn't it? Have you ever been tempted to think that within the world of Christians, there's an elite group? You know, the kind of Christians who seem deeply, consistently prayerful, who have amazing faith, whose lives don't seem to reveal a struggle with sin, whose response to hardship is serene, who just seem more on top of things spiritually. You know, a long time ago, when I was 16, my dad got me a holiday job in what was then called Baptist Bookstore. We don't have one today. I loved the job because I love books. And I found a biography of a man called C.T. Studd, who became the founder of WEC International. He was famous for his quote, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Well, you know, this book was absolutely inspirational. He worked as a missionary in China, India, and Africa. But this is the interesting thing. Six years later, I was in Bible college, and I read another biography called Reluctant Missionary. And I have to be honest, it made me laugh so much all the way through it. And it was written by his fourth daughter, Edith Buxton. She and her husband worked alongside C.T. Studd in Africa. And not only did she talk about her own experience, warts and all, but she dispelled a lot of myths about her father. Yes, by God's grace, he achieved much. However, he was far from perfect. And some of the things he said and did would make us cringe today. Of course, we have to remember he was a strong-minded man and a product of his own colonial era. But at times, C.T. Studd could just be plain difficult to live with. Well, you know, in Romans 8, Paul is not talking about overcomers or conquerors as an elite group. The us he speaks of includes all Christians, ordinary but genuine Christians. We'll just reflect for a few moments on that passage. In verses 28 to 30, he talks about God's predetermined purpose for believers. We have been chosen to become like Jesus. And to that end, God calls believers, he acquits them by forgiving their sin, he declares them not guilty in Jesus, he puts them in right standing with himself and he makes them his children. And in the future, he glorifies them. In verses 31 to 34, we're told that God's work for us in Christ puts us in a secure, invincible position. No opposition of any significance, no accusation that can stand, no condemnation, because God has given a verdict of innocent that stands forever. And then in verses 35 to 39, we read the beautiful part that says there is no separation from God's love in Christ. And in this section, it's as if someone hearing all about Jesus Christ and what he's done asks, are you sure there's nothing that can cut us off or drive a wedge between us and God? And in Paul's response, he lists specific examples of circumstances that we as human beings tend to view 
as evidence of God's abandonment or lack of love. Things like pain, persecution, lack of material resources. How often do we take these circumstances as an indication that God isn't there for us? You know, the list that Paul gives is not haphazard, it's not hypothetical. It actually reflects his own experiences. And we read of them in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I don't know about you, but when I read that list of things that Paul has gone through, I actually feel exhausted, and I haven't even done them. How did he get up and keep going? And Paul goes on to say, in all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through him who has proved his love for us. Do you know, he actually says we are super conquerors. In all these things, he's referring to our security in what Christ has done and the love that we enjoy. And so there's a sense that already we are overcomers. We have that status in Jesus. And yet you and I know that we live in a kind of now but not yet experience. There is more to come. And through perseverance in the midst of our spiritual opposition, our trials, the hardships of life, we are overcomers. Now, one of the problems we have is that we see overcoming as winning, as coming out on top and looking good. And that's not always God's way. As one writer says, God uses apparent defeat to produce ultimate glory. And I think the best place to see that is at the cross. You know that biblical reference he threw in, Psalm 44? It kind of almost seems to be a tangent, but there actually is a connection. Because in Psalm 44, the psalmist gets to a point where he kind of says to God, I can understand all the stuff and difficulties and trouble that we're having if we had turned away from you and followed idols but we haven't. There's no obvious sin, but we're suffering, and we're suffering innocently. And Paul is making it clear that some of the suffering Christians experience, and that's you and I, may be undeserved. It may be unjust. It's not related to personal sin. Nevertheless, Paul is absolutely convinced that no matter what Christians deal with, it will not cut them off from God's love. So we enjoy the spiritual status of being overcomers. But looking at everyday life, where's the evidence? What do we look for? And I believe it's perseverance, persevering to the very end of our lives in our faith, irrespective of what comes our way. And I don't believe that it's just a kind of stoic resignation and gritting your teeth and saying, I'll get through this somehow. I believe it's something far better and greater than that. And so I thought this morning we might look at a few cameos from the Bible. That's brief pictures of Bible characters in their struggles and their adversity. And of course, I don't have time to go into great depth with them. The first I wanted us to look at was the prophet Elijah from 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah had a resounding victory in a contest with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel when God showed up in power. The prophets of Baal were seized and slaughtered. However, the positive outcome that Elijah anticipated didn't eventuate. Instead, Queen Jezebel, the priestess of Baal, threatened to kill him. And this courageous man sank in despair and fear. Terrified, he ran to the desert. And exhausted, he prayed, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. God didn't have a go at him. He dealt with him very gently. He sent an angel with food and water, 
twice, and in between, he just let Elijah sleep. And after this, Elijah went on to Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai, called the Mountain of God. And you remember that that's where Moses got the Ten Commandments. That's where the people of Israel saw God in all his power. They were quite scared, actually. So much history in that mountain. And at this place, twice God confronted Elijah with this question, helping him to face up to his true condition. What are you doing here, Elijah? And I don't think he was referring to the geographical location. I think he was referring to his mental, emotional, and spiritual condition. And it could be that God's asking you this morning What are you doing here? Why are you in this condition? Twice Elijah replied in an identical manner. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they've put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left now and they're trying to kill me too. It sounds to me like Elijah had kind of rehearsed this story in his mind and he had it off pat. You know, we do that, don't we, a lot. In counseling, I talk about negative meditation. Rehearsing, nursing, and cursing. We go over and over the story in our minds. We hold on tight to our wounded feelings so that they get stronger. And then in our pain and our anger and disappointment, we want to see others get hurt too. We want to see them get paid back. Basically, we want revenge. Do you know that Elijah's thinking was quite skewed? The way he thought about himself and the way he thought about the Israelites. He only saw the negative. He was totally dejected. He felt he had borne all the burden, he was the only faithful Israelite, and he was full of self-pity. Do you know, God had to set the picture straight. He said to Elijah, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all those knees who have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Do you know, it's not events so much as our thoughts, our interpretations of events that produce our emotions. Did you get that? It's our interpretation of events that produce our emotions. Elijah needed to correct his thoughts. He needed God to help him with that and to transform his attitude so that he got to a place where that dejection lifted. And God did this for him as Elijah engaged with him, with the result that once again he became active and involved in ministry. And God provided him with a companion, Elisha, who became his successor. Did you know that there are other people in the Old Testament who also desired to die? There was Job, of course we know he went through one tragedy after another. There was Moses, And there was Jonah. You know, leadership got too much for Moses at one point. And in Exodus chapter 11, after a tirade, Moses finished by saying to God, if this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. But what about Jonah? What was his struggle? Why did he want to die? Jonah was commissioned by God to preach in the foreign city of Nineveh but he didn't want to. The Ninevites were cruel, they were warlike people who had been long-term enemies of Israel. In fact, they were known for flaying the skin off their prisoners and also beheading them. Jonah tried to escape God by jumping on a ship in the opposite direction. You know, this was so inconsistent, given his words to the terrified sailors later who were afraid their ship was going to break up in the violent storm. Because then, Jonah said this, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and land. 
How did he think he was going to escape on the sea then? Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, which following prayer spat him out on dry land. Jonah did go to Nineveh, and he did warn its inhabitants about God's judgment. His preaching was successful. They repented, and God relented, but Jonah was not happy. You'd think he would be if his preaching worked so well. And this is what we read. Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And God asked that question a second time when Jonah got angry about a vine that grew up and sheltered him, but then withered away and left him unprotected and faint in the blazing sun. And Jonah again declared that he did have a right to be angry, and he was angry enough to die. So what really caused Jonah's distress? I think it's just because he didn't like the way God did things. Have you ever been in that place? He certainly didn't believe that ungodly people should be recipients of God's mercy. However, earlier on, he'd been quite happy for God to shower mercy on him. I think at the root of things, I suspect there was a belief that he was more deserving than these people. Was Jonah an overcomer? Do you know we don't actually know? Because the story is left hanging. From all indications, Jonah's desires were not aligned with God's. And his own experience of mercy did not translate into extending mercy to others. Have you ever been a Jonah? Or could you be a Jonah today? You know, I have been. I can remember quite a number of years ago, I had a conflict with someone with whom I was working. It wasn't major, but I got very distressed about it. And I tried to pray about it. And I said to God, you know what the problem is right now? I said, I know that you love that person as much as you love me. But I want you to just be on my side. We can have these very um, unchristian attitudes, can't we? You know, when we surrender our anger and our self-righteous passions to God, he can transform our lives. The third person in the Old Testament is Hannah. You know, Hannah was the first of two wives in a polygamous marriage. She had a deep grief because she was infertile. And in those days, barrenness was considered a reproach from God, a shameful condition that meant a woman had failed in her duty to her husband. It frequently resulted in social rejection and in Hannah's case, humiliation by the second wife. And this behavior was no doubt promoted by jealousy because despite her infertility, Elkanah, her husband, loved his wife and tried to compensate for her sense of loss. But do you know scripture tells us the Lord had closed her womb? You know, because we're Christians and we believe that God is sovereign, he's in control, and he's powerful, suffering can throw up a whole lot of questions in our minds and hearts. And sometimes, Suffering triggers a faith crisis in people. Each year, this family would go to the tabernacle in Shiloh to worship God. And each year, the taunting from the second wife would be cruel. 
On one occasion, Hannah went to the temple in deep anguish and she wept bitterly. And as she prayed, she made a promise. She said, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me. And that word in the Old Testament always means action, not just a thought in the head. And not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. Elkanah was a descendant of Levi and they were the um, priestly tribe. I believe that Levites usually served God from the age of 25 to 50 years of age. But here, Hannah was saying, you can have him for the whole of his life. And her faith preserved her in her suffering. I believe Hannah became an overcomer because on this day, her request was motivated by a desire to glorify God, not simply to alleviate her own heartache or to become a real woman in the eyes of everyone else. I believe Hannah saw that there was a bigger picture. And when she came back two or three years later to leave Samuel at the temple, and mums, can you imagine how hard that would be to leave your child in the care of someone else? And if you read scripture, you'll see that um, the priests at that time, Eli's sons, weren't actually very honorable. But her amazing prayer of praise in the next chapter shows that she had a heart that knew God better and depended on him. And someone said this, pain rightly used increases our capacity for God. You know, in many respects, Samuel turned the nation around from what had been a very dark era in their history. So Hannah's suffering resulted in glory to God and blessing to others. But what about the Apostle Paul? We read his words earlier. You know, when the Apostle Paul spoke of being more than conquerors, he spoke of a reality that he himself lived. You and I know he encountered terrible adversity in his ministry, but he persevered faithfully to the end. He got knocked down so many times, but he always got up again. In God's strength, he overcame many setbacks. And then we have that passage that I'm sure is familiar to you in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, where Paul speaks of a thorn in the flesh seems to be some kind of physical disability that hampered his ministry. We don't exactly know. But he pleaded with God three times to remove this obstacle. And what did God say? He said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you know what Paul's response was to that? I'm going to read it from the message. He said, I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. He realized it kept him humble and dependent. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. I just let Christ take over. Of course, Jesus Christ is the greatest overcomer of all. In the garden, he overcame his dread of being the sin bearer for the world. On the cross, he overcame the rejection and humiliation by praying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And by giving up his life and then rising again, he overcame sin and death. The Lord Jesus persevered on this earth to triumphantly fulfill all his Father's will. So how do we become overcomers in everyday life? We've got that status, but we have to live it out. I'm just going to give you four points, and these are not exhaustive. First of all, we need to stay in relationship with Christ, who is our overcomer. How often, when things are difficult, 
do we pull away from God or we shut down on him? Stay in relationship. Secondly, we need to surrender our natural human reactions that rise in difficult times, whether that's fear or whether it's anxiety, whether it's pain and heartache, whether it's anger. And we need to allow God to take hold of them and transform them so that we can respond as Jesus would. And thirdly, we need to think about our circumstances through the lens of biblical truth. So often, we just ride on our emotions. But we need to remember God is sovereign. He is in control. We need to hold on to that security we have in him because of all that Jesus did. And we need to be convinced that we are inseparable from his love. And finally, we need to persevere in faith because there is so much that we cannot see, that we cannot understand, that we can't make sense of. We need to trust God can use our circumstances for our spiritual well-being, to make us more like Jesus, to lead us to our final destiny. And we need to believe that our circumstances, though difficult, can serve God's purposes. And as in the case of Hannah, they can bring him glory and can be used to bless others. Let's pray as we finish. I want to ask you this question to reflect on for just a minute. What might overcoming look like in your life today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word that came through the pen of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for his life, which was a tremendous example of overcoming, of persevering. Lord, I pray for us all here this morning. Maybe for some of us, overcoming means coming back to you, breaking down the walls, opening our hearts up, Maybe for others, overcoming means letting go our anger or our unforgiveness, and we can only do that with your help. Maybe overcoming means moving out into the weak, holding on to you in confidence, even though there's a lot to make us fearful. Lord, maybe overcoming means examining the kind of thoughts we have about you about ourselves, about our conditions. Maybe overcoming means holding on to scripture and believing that whatever situation we're in, you can use it for our good and even to bring good for the lives of others. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.